peekaboo. Oh, oh, just a little off the shoulder nod before you, my adoring fan. <laughs> Let me find my spotlight. Just like daddy taught me, where's the limelight? Ah, there it is. Ah, I found my natural home. So you get to see my shoulders and you get to see the wonderful looks that I can give to the camera <laughs> because I'm a model. I'm a model. <laughs> that girl, that girl, she's back. The starlet. Never a harlot, my dear. Don't you dare cast such an aspersion. Hollywood starlet is back. And we are going to discuss that appearance at the variety power of women event in a few moments. We will discuss that. She's a gift to womankind, that gal. Or humankind, as Catherine put it, and as we discussed in the last broadcast. I'm not keen on the expression humankind. I prefer mankind. You guys were split on it. Some of you vociferously defended Catherine using humankind, and that is your preference, and I accept it. But I was speaking about the likes of me and the likes of people with good taste. You know, a certain sector of society would stick with mankind, my dear, regardless of fashions that come and go, or Charles Darwin's preference, or whatever it is, my dear. But I did warn, I did warn that no matter if Catherine uses a word like humankind to make sure that it's not offended, offending anybody, I did warn that it would actually end up offending somebody who didn't fit into that category. And the timing was absolutely perfect because this week, 50 cent, good old fiddy, good old fiddy fiddle, fiddle dee dee, fiddle dee doo da. He came forward and he has let everybody know that he no longer identifies as a person. He is a thing. He is a thing. Well, he's certainly something, isn't he, my dears? Humankind is not inclusive enough for him. Do you see what I mean, my dear? Do you understand my point? He's not part of humankind or mankind. He is thing kind. So that's got to be included. There's got to be some way. And actually, you know, I went down a bit of a wormhole because on his social media or whatever it was, he he put up a post of one of his fans bopping along to his recent show in Birmingham. And it was rather delicious. <laughs> she was bopping along and swaying and getting down with it and jiggy with the crowd. Rather wonderful. And she became a viral superstar. She's been interviewed. And she's only 64, actually. She's only 64. Um, she looked a little bit older from a distance, but she's in the autumn season and she's wonderful, very youthful. And she knows more about urban music and culture than a lot of the kids she was with. She was attending with her son, but I thought I'd share that moment with you because it was wonderful. And it really was a week for scandalous rumours. I've got to tell you, at the same time I was looking over this, news stories were emerging this week that had me dissolving in a fit of giggles because there's so much serious stuff going on right now, isn't there? Headline after headline is just, uh, 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 take me out of this cruel world. And then you have the likes of Will Smith. Have you been here? <laughs> <laughs> one shouldn't laugh if you don't know you will have to get googling my dear but will smith has been coming in for some rumors this week one of his closest friends of 40 years i believe brother bilal has fallen out with will smith and he worked with him for a very long time well he claims in an interview he's been claiming that he caught will smith in a dressing room was it with his Another friend of his, Dwayne Martin, <laughs> oh dear, caught in an act of congregation, shall we say, in a dressing room. Apparently they were going at it like hammer and tong. And he cast all kinds of aspersions, my dear. And, you know, it's cruel, it's unfortunate. And I must say for legal reasons that I'm quite sure, I'm quite sure that there's every chance in the world that it is absolute nonsense on stilts. I'm certainly not declaring it as my opinion for legal reasons. I must make that very clear. But that is what has emerged. And the other one was P. Diddy. P. Diddy Diddle Dumpling. They're all these diddies and fiddies, aren't they, my dear? P. Diddy actually really rather serious claims from his ex-partner of many years that he was, how shall we say, if he was a bird species, he might have been a cuckoo, cuck for short, because he seemed to enjoy hiring other men of colour from around the globe, importing them in and uh, 
participating in various sessions for many years. I'm not going to go into the details, myself, and I'm certainly not saying that that's true, but he did settle today instead of going to court with, with the girl he decided to settle. Well, thank heavens for a moment of royalty to distract us from this kind of vulgarity that is emanating from all over the globe. <laughs> thank heavens for royalty. And the Queen celebrated 140 years of the Queen's Commonwealth Essay Prize with winners, supporters and a host of well-known writers. And look, there's Patsy Stone. Yes, even our darling Patsy is there at Buckingham Palace. Then a wonderful time was had by all. And meanwhile, the King joined over 30 faith leaders to mark the Interfaith Week. Oh, go another week. His Majesty has worked for many years to promote tolerance and greater understanding between different faiths and communities. Mm, very noble, very noble. Maybe I'm getting a bit cynical. It'll probably come back to haunt him or his heirs a few years down the line, to be quite honest with you. I mean, let's face it, what does defender of the faith actually mean? And who is defending this faith at this moment in time? It's not really a criticism of Charles. He's in an impossible kind of place at the moment. And we know that he sees himself or wants his role to be more as defender of faith. But he is the existing defender of the faith, presumably meaning the one heralded by the Church of England and the Christian faith that styles him, you know, he is styled Charles III by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and of his other realms and territories, King, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith. We need to start putting the traditional faith back at the heart of this country as far as I'm concerned, because in England there is this established church and the reason that I'm vociferous about this is because I do believe that this involves the spiritual health of the nation. And at the moment, that spiritual health is haywire and at risk of damage. And the spiritual health of a nation is inextricably linked to the nation's fortitude and its sense of patriotism. And I know that the royal family have got their work cut out at the moment and I know that they do more than just about anyone for the Church of England and the Christian faith. In some ways they promote it better than the Church of England do themselves. But I do feel that there should be an active strand and I don't know who should head it up within the royal family to do their bit to actually actively promote the Church of England and Christianity. as something at the root and heart of this nation because it is at the root and heart of everything that England represents whether you're atheist or not and at Lambeth Palace Library His Majesty viewed an exhibition of interfaith items from its historic collection and amongst the items were documents relating to Project Spire ongoing research on the links between the Church of England's endowment fund known as Queen Anne's Bounty. I love that, don't you? Queen Anne's Bounty. Oh, come, taste the bounty. Wonderful for Queen Anne. Love it. Uh, well, the connection between that bounty and transatlantic slavery. Ooh, boring, boring. More navel gazing. Great. And darling Patsy popped up again. Was it Patsy or Purdy? I don't know, but it was certainly our dear Dame Joanna Lumley. You know, she might as well become a Queen's companion, don't you think? She should be a Queen's companion for Queen Camilla and Giles Brandreth, old Jilly Brandreth. She's always popping up, isn't she, in everything involving the King. King's companion, perhaps, or a groom of the stool, whatever it might be. Uh, I digress, but their majesties were hosting a gathering at Buckingham Palace to mark the 60th anniversary of the Disasters Emergency Committee and to thank some of the many people who are part of the UK's contribution to humanitarianism. And there were joyful scenes on the streets of New Malden. Doesn't it look delicious? Much gaiety among this vibrant Korean community. And that is the sort of incoming community that enhances our society. Enhances our society. They don't just come in to take, take, take. They are enhancers and they behave themselves. And who wouldn't want to welcome them? This is ahead of the President and First Lady of the Republic of Korea, their state visit in a few weeks time where they will be received by their majesties. 
And Meghan wasn't the only one that's been striking a pose recently, but Zara Tyndall shows how you do it with a royal spin. Here she is striking a pose. Strike a pose. Uh, voguing for Australian brand Rebecca Valance. For the brand's relaunch, Harrods. The dress you can buy for £640 off the peg. Black and silver puff sleeve affair with diamante beading. She accessorised with pearl drops to the ears and looked very fresh faced, didn't she? She really is a handsome woman. A handsome woman, extremely sexy, and a wonderful model. But do you see how she manages? She's still posing. She's still doing her bit for the camera, but with no air of narcissism. No air of stroking one's own ego. Which you get with Megan, more on that in a minute. But over at Highgrove, I had to share this cosy, cosy, cosy footage of last week's birthday boy with cake at a tea party that was held at Highgrove for the king, along with those people and the organisations that also turned 75 years of age. There was so much going on that I couldn't cover it all last week. But here you see choirs and there were doggy bags for everyone to take home. It was so gay, so festive. But now we turn to the Duchess of Sussex. We can't escape it, can we? <laughs> we can't escape it because the privacy tour still has a few stops left this year. And it's going to be chugging along every year thereafter, isn't it? The privacy tour. Here it comes. Here it comes. Well, the dress. Should we begin with the dress? It was like a slick of Vaseline. A slick of Vaseline to grease her entrance. The press were calling it beige. I call it sludge. Now, this isn't a criticism, but she has no bust and no waist. That's just a fact. It's not a criticism. And if I were her, I would cheat that. I would cheat that fact with either a better suited gown to begin with, something that suits me better, or tailoring. There is the option of tailoring or a bit of cinching, pinching and padding, to be quite honest with you, my dear. You know, but that's my affair. That's how I do things. Her figure is boyish. The gal has a boyish figure. And that can be very chic. I say it can be very chic. Then there are other occasions when it cannot. And this was one of them. You know, many women have boyish figures. It's not unusual uh, for a slightly more androgynous look. And many can look very attractive with that boyish look. And some men, you know, obviously such as Harry, are attracted to that sort of boyish figure. They love it. Uh, so it can be wonderful, you know. He evidently swoons over that kind of shape. There's someone for everyone, isn't there, my dear? Someone for everyone. And they share that shape. They share that shape. This is the wonderful thing about that too, in tandem, in romantic tandem. They share that shape of the boxy torso and then spindly limbs hanging off of it. So I think that's quite sweet. It can look extremely elegant, gamin, if well executed. But this wasn't well executed, my dear. You know, you've got to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. How many times do I have to say that? This, you know, you're a Hollywood star, my dear. So you tell us. <laughs> so you insist. So you should know the rules of Golden Hollywood, of the Golden Hollywood age. You know, because Meghan Sussex has chosen to do the exact opposite. The exact opposite. This brazen, brazen on stilts. Blue steel meets slippery eel. And it's quite obvious to me why she does all this twisting and turning and the contorting as if she is a professional model. You ain't a professional model, love it. You just ain't. She twists and turns because if she was to stand still and pre present that gown front on, with none of the contortions, it wouldn't be pretty. It wouldn't be a pretty vision. It wouldn't be flattering. Now there are gowns, you know, all it would take is a bit of imagination to be able to stand there as she is and look good. But you know, she would probably have to throw something like this over her, a wrap or a poncho. Whatever sin is on show can be concealed, can be disguised with a bit of imagination, a veil, a shrug. I don't know. You'll have to work it out, my dear. Some sort of affair, but that wasn't it. But that's why she twists and turns and contorts and throws the head over her shoulder. Because, you know, she's just straining, straining 
to find all these angles that will do her justice. Find a tailor. Find an atelier that can do the job for you. You know. This was how Wallace Simpson made the most of herself. You are similar to Bessie Wallace Simpson in some ways, in the fact that there's not that much to work with. But the way that Bessie Wallace was able to shine was because she had taste, she had sophistication, she knew how to throw a look together, the cut, the material, uh, to elevate what she was into something that actually outshone some of the beauties of the era, because it transcended that. That's called chic, that's called style. And uh, I suppose it can't be taught, but you'd think with all her billions, she could rope someone in to train her up a bit and give her some real honest advice. But she doesn't take advice. She's too impatient for that. I want this and I want that. And I know Edward Ellenfall, and you know, I taught him a few things and I can teach Anna a few things. And I can teach them all, because I'm an executive and I'll tell them what's key. <laughs> I don't need advice, I'll do it my way. Well, that's what you get. And don't interrupt, don't you dare interrupt her while she's vamping. <laughs> She'll still flash that smile, but you'll see. You'll see in those little moments between the scenes, the ice, the ice. I'm finding my light, I'm finding my light. <laughs> the cameras want me, dear. You know, you're a great friend, I love you. Oh, let's catch up in a moment, but the cameras want me. The cameras have been waiting for my moment. <laughs> oh dear. And that off the shoulder number that she was it highlights her elbow. If that was my elbow, I wouldn't want to highlight it. You know, it's sadly not that flattering. It's not that flattering. The updo, I can't complain about because you know her hair can annoy me when it's tumbling all over the place. So I can't really complain, can I? I mean, the, the lashes looked a bit wonky in some photographs I saw, a little bit like six-year-old gal dress, dressing up in mum's lashes, but if that's what she wants to do, that's, that's fine. So many exciting things on the plate, she tells us. I've got so many exciting things on the plate. Well, try a burger and fries, love. <laughs> try a fat burger. Yeah, put that on your plate. I can't wait until we can announce them, she tells us. Oh. And we'll give you the exclusive for a fee. I'm so proud of what we are creating, she says. Oh, we're so excited, Megan. We are absolutely champing at the bit. Oh, and she tells us, my husband is loving it too. My husband is loving it. What you mean, Harry? We've had this conversation a few times as well, haven't we? What's all this, my husband? You ain't the queen. You ain't Catherine, you ain't royal. Just call him Harry. He is Harry. What is all this my husband, my wife, malarkey? Oh. Well, I didn't know he was famous. I didn't know he was royal. So maybe you don't know his name. Maybe you don't know who Harry is. You know, I never Googled him. I just thought he was some random pale ginger freckly dude. And I fell hopelessly in love with him. I thought he was a pauper. I didn't know. I just didn't know that he was a prince. <laughs> And then they just suckered me into this cool family. This cool, racist, bigoted family. <laughs> and didn't I read, I, I forgot to look into this, but I think I saw a headline flash up saying that she praised the Queen for being some sort of store or epitome of fantastic womanhood, whatever it was, my dear. Well, we'll look at that in another broadcast, because she's certainly changing her tune, isn't she? Certainly doing a bit of a, what is it they call it, a swivel? No, that's not the word, a swivel. Pivot, pivot, they're pivoting. The pivoting prince. And the duplicitous duchess. Terrible. So proud of what we are creating. You're creating mischief, dear. The expressions she pulls are fascinating, aren't they? She's, she's like, I'm attentive. I'm attentive to you. That was one. How interesting is the other one? And she really does look, you know, she's studied the, the art of how to win friends and influence people and how to charm. I am really there for you. I'm going to bake you cookies. Niceties, niceties. And then... 
And then just in the moment, the eyes dart off somewhere. Who else is around in the room? And you see that little, you, you can tell she's very impatient. And actually, the place where you see a glimpse of it, just a glimpse of it in Meghan and Harry on Netflix, is a moment when William texts Harry. You might recall that that was one of the moments you, where you saw the mask slip and you saw her irritation, and you can imagine how she prances around Montecito, uh, ordering Harry about and complaining about every member of the royal family. You saw a glimpse of it because she's ve she's very very good at masking over it and covering it up for everybody else. But ooh, to be a fly on the wall, ooh, to be a fly on the wall and get a glimpse of the real, the real Rachel. And you get little glimpses of it. For example, the other day was it a veterans thing. That Harry was having a conversation with somebody there. And she just oh so gently goes back and coaxes him along. Come on, Harry. Come on. I've done my vamping. I've done my introductions. We have other things to do. We're running late. It's so rude. How dare she? How dare any woman? Well, Harry lets her. Harry lets her. Harry loves it. This is the thing. He loves being bossed about. Well. Let's get off of that subject altogether. There's just too much vulgarity in the world. The Prince of Wales visited Moss Side in Manchester, spotlighting vital work that's being carried out in the area to support communities and improve outcomes for young people. He unveiled a three-year commitment to help reduce youth violence, which will see the Royal Foundation and the Mayor of Greater Manchester join forces with £100,000 funding to support the work of Manchester Peace Together Alliance. Businesses have come together and committed to providing support, such as work shadowing, apprenticeships and employment for young people at risk of violence. And it must be noted, quite satisfyingly, it must be noted that for all of Harry and Meghan's besmirchments and their defaming over the last few years, have you noticed that the working life of the royal family has never been under such positive scrutiny? and has never been so admired. Yes, they might be taking heat in various quarters from those rare admirers of the Sussexes, but they are being overwhelmed and outweighed by the rest of the globe who see everything that the royal family do. No longer do people ask quite as much as they used to. What do they actually do? What do they actually contribute? Well, it's being laid out for the world to see, isn't it, my dear, on various platforms, social media, and such like. It's working to their advantage. Do you see? Do you understand? It's working out really rather plump. Really rather plump. Yeah. And one child even asked how much money William was worth. <laughs> how naughty. He said, well, he said, how much money is in your bank account? This was a young 11-year-old Amir Hassan. Uh, and of course, Prince William was discreet and said, I don't know. I don't know. Well, we know, don't we? Lots. <laughs> and we were treated to some footage capturing the lithe and lism frames of the Prince and Princess of Wales in the Bahamas. This was back during 2022, but this has only just been released. They were visiting one of the Earthshot Prize winners, Coral Vita, who create coral farms to restore the reefs. Oh, can you imagine Harry and Meghan in flippers and a wetsuit? <laughs> Perish the thought. Sophie Edinburgh had a lovely day in Winchester as patron of Brendan Care, where she visited a new care home and she opened it at St Giles's View. She decorated a cake to celebrate the King's birthday and took afternoon tea and she wore a beautiful number. See, this is how you do beige. This is how you do simple, elegant beige. Worlds apart from what we've seen in other quarters. Gabriella Hurst, cashmere and silk, really beautiful. Very engaging she was, she had a lot of fun. And if you think you might have seen that dress somewhere before, when well, you have, it was on Princess Usually a few years ago. Yes, she wore it too. And there were some adorable photographs of our steady Eddie nose nuzzling. Oh, isn't it adorable? I just love it. And he was cloaked in feathers during his visit to the Asia Pacific. They get about, don't they, those Edinburgh's? They really do. This was in his role as global patron of the International Award, and he was officially welcomed to Atara at Blue Light in Auckland. They were celebrating 60 years of the Duke of Edinburgh's Hillary Award, and His Royal Highness met award participants as they completed activities from journey planning to high ropes and camp skills. I've got a few of them myself. 
And here's old Dickie Gloucester out and about carrying out engagements in Berkshire, touring Abbey Gateway and ruins and visiting churches. Yes, as royal patron of the British Museum, the Duke of Gloucester viewed their archaeological research collection. How boring. And I thought I'd share with you some complimentary words from Brigitte Macron in the wake of the visit to France with the King and Queen. She gave a rare interview to Paris Match magazine and uh, she spoke about King Charles and Queen Camilla and she said, when the royal couple came, I was worried. I don't know why, but she was. But right from their arrival at the Arc de Triomphe, when Camilla got out of the car and kissed me, they set the tone. He is very polished, very cultivated, very funny. What sums them up is their delicacy. And I thought that was a lovely thing to say, and very French as well, is their delicacy. She said that in private they are discreet, but charming. She said on the Thursday evening they came for an aperitif at the Elysee because they do not eat much. They don't eat much, there were just the four of us. A marvellous moment. There they were, Charles and Camilla. The next day they left for Bordeaux. So kind words there from Brigitte. And actually I've always found the French to be particularly perhaps rather more accepting, less judgmental about affairs of the heart, passions, forbidden fruit, as Brigitte Macron knows only too well, my dear, you know there's a sort of fatalism that the French traditionally understood about affairs of the heart. Uh, very accepting of the King and Queen and their relationship and spoke very, very respectfully, so I really appreciate that. Merci. Lovely to see you, my dears. Thank you for popping in with me to share a gossip and a cup of tea. I'll see you next time. Take care and toodle pip.